This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Netanyahu bears responsibility for this Israel-Gaza war. That's the headline of an editorial in the Israeli newspaper Haaretz. The paper's editors wrote, quote, The disaster that befell Israel on the holiday of Simchat Torah is the clear responsibility of one person, Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister, who's prided himself on his vast political experience and irreplaceable wisdom in security matters, completely failed to identify the dangers he was consciously leading Israel into when establishing a government of annexation and dispossession, when appointing Bezalel Smotrich and Itamar Ben-Gavir to key positions, while embracing a foreign policy that openly ignored the existence and rights of Palestinians, the Haaretz editorial said. We go now to Tel Aviv, where we're joined by Gidon Levy, an award-winning Israeli journalist and author, columnist for the newspaper Haaretz, member of its editorial board. His most recent piece is headlined, Israel Can't Imprison Two Million Gazans Without Paying a Cruel Price. Gidon Levy, if you can talk about how Israelis are responding right now, what you feel it's important for people outside Israel, especially here in the United States, to understand and to do at this point as 300,000 reservists uh, move along the Gaza border. Yeah, Israel is basically shocked, at least in the first one or two days, you could feel it everywhere. Nobody expected this unprecedented uh, uh, situation. It broke many perceptions, both about Hamas, about the Palestinians, yeah. about their capabilities, and about ourselves yeah. and our capabilities. But this is now put aside. People are still digesting what happened. The more uh, time passes, the more horrible scenes are exposed. Day after day, I've been to the south uh, the day before yesterday, and I can tell you I've been so many times in the south in times of war. What I saw there was nothing like it happened in the past. But I must say that side by side with what I uh, may mention here, there is also a big sense of taking revenge, a big desire to take revenge and hatred toward the Palestinians is growing up to very, very dangerous levels. Same anger is also directed at the government, less than this at the army. But I think that the, gov the government, once this war will be over, hopefully soon, this government is going to pay a hell of a price and it will must go home. I don't see the situation in which Netanyahu continues and all the ministers around him, who are all of them, no one's fascists, and they part of them would have even been defined in Europe as neo-Nazis. Those people who called for all kinds of terrible things to do and did nothing to make Israel prepared for any danger and continue not to doing nothing. That's so astonishing that we are now the fifth day after the war and you don't see the government. They are still preoccupied with their own political careers, with all kinds of political manipulations. Nobody takes care of the situation. The army is preparing itself for a ground operation. But except of the army, I was in so many homes which were bombed, so many people who lost their, their beloved one. Nobody came to them. Nobody offers them any assistance. Israel is really falling apart from this point of view. And the man who governed Israel for the last 15 years is the one and the only one to be blamed before anyone else. This goes without saying. And I guess at six after the war, as we say, million Israelis will go to the streets and they will have only one demand. At least Netanyahu go home. If not, Netanyahu go to court and be sentenced for this irresponsible policy that you uh, have been uh, committing. Uh, Gidon, uh, Gidon Levy, 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 I wanted to ask you, the, the, uh, so according to press reports, as many as 1,500 uh, uh, Palestinian fighters of Hamas were killed inside of Israel. 
so the 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 enormous number of of militants who were able to get into Israel. Could you talk about the decision of the government to relocate large portions of the of Israel's army from the Gaza border to protect uh, far right uh, settlers on the West Bank? Sure, that's that's one of the big of the big. Uh, failures uh, on Saturday, not the only one, because the first failure is obviously the surprise, the strategic surprise. We are so proud about the most sophisticated intelligence in the world with all kind of those elite units, with all the devices. They know everything, they understand everything. And then an operation which was prepared for one year by hundreds of militants, they didn't hear about it. So that's the first failure. The second failure is obviously that the southern front with Gaza was totally abandoned because we were busy with all the festivals of Sukkot, of those crazy settlers, guarding them, but not only guarding them, collaborating with them, with their pogroms among Palestinians. We have clear evidence that the army saw the pogroms and did nothing. And when the army is busy for years now, not only recently, only with running and chasing after Palestinian children who throw a stone and, and after all kind of uh, suspected Palestinians. When the army is overoccupied in standing in illegal checkpoints and penetrating to Palestinian homes in the middle of the night to arrest somebody without any, any legal basis, then this is the result. You get, instead of a professional, motivated, experienced army, you get a bunch of no ones who don't know to, what to do in, in, in such a situation. Because after the first shock, there was still, it took still hours and hours until the army showed up. And that's unbelievable. And this issue of uh, Netanyahu preparing for an invasion of, uh, of Gaza, the you talk about the immense uh, undertaking that this involves, having to go literally house by house or building by building in Gaza uh, to uh, to find uh, any of the uh, any of the hostages being held. Uh, the, the enormity of this project. First of all, to go from building to building is impossible already, because there were many buildings still down, and uh, I, I'm not sure that. How many buildings were left, for example, in the neighborhood of Rimal? To find the hostages uh, alive, really, it's, a ni it's nice for all kind of, of, of Hollywood films. I don't see it happening, for sure not with this army, with its capabilities, as we were witnessing it only on Saturday. The invasion into Gaza has some other uh, goals namely to put an end to the to the rule of Hamas. And this is another impossible mission, because you can kill the current uh, uh, top people of Hamas. You cannot kill the ideology of Hamas. And they will always be replaced. The ground operation now is supported almost by all Israelis, because Israelis understand that, that we have to do something after this embarrassment, after this catastrophe. But at the same time, I must tell you, I can ensure you that if Israel will go now for a ground operation, it will take a few weeks or maybe a few months. It will take so much blood of both Palestinians and Israelis, mainly Palestinians, obviously. And by the end of this operation, you will invite me again to democracy now, and you will see that we are standing exactly in the place that we stood one week ago. Because as long as Israel continues to believe that Gaza, the problem of Gaza will be solved by the sword, solved by brutal force, by emotions of, of revenge, justified emotions, then we will get exactly to the same place. This vicious circle will not be solved by power, not be solved by tanks, and not will be, not will be solved, will it be solved by troops, only by a political agreement, and above all, and first of all, lifting this criminal siege, for God's sake, after 17 years. This siege what was about to 
to guarantee the, the security of Israel. So what happened out of the siege, except of the suffer of un unbelievable, inhuman suffer of two million people? What did it contribute to the to the security of Israel? This siege. You see the outcome. We just have less than a minute, Gidon. I wanted to ask you the difference of the cry, the call of the families of the hostages, of older people, of young people, of children, uh, the family members, one after another, talking about being, for example, a peace activist and saying, please use restraint. And the contrast between that and President Biden, as he addressed the nation yesterday, deciding consciously and in the readout of his conversation with Netanyahu um, a few minutes before he spoke, saying they did not call for restraint. Your response, how important is the president of the United States' position here? We have less than a minute. In less than a minute, I can tell you, Amy, that last night when I was watching President Biden, I really envied you, Americans, that you have such a leader. I never thought so before last night. But last night, Biden was a real leader, someone that you can trust because he was extremely sincere and someone that you can rely on. If Netanyahu would have taken the same speech, he wouldn't be Netanyahu. Netanyahu is busy with politics, and here comes this Biden and tells Israel what Israel wanted to hear. I would love him also to say some things about the Palestinian suffering, the Palestinian agony. He ignored it totally, and this is very regretful. But by the end of the day, this is what Israel needs now, some kind of leadership, and he totally lacks it. Nobody is around really to understand that we have to go for a new way. Nobody is there. Gideon Levy, we want to thank you for being with us, an award-winning Israeli journalist and author, columnist for the newspaper Aretz, a member of its editorial board. We'll link to your most recent piece, Israel Can't Imprison Two Million Gazans Without Paying a Cruel Price. His books include The Punishment of Gaza.